Desi, welcome. I never knew TV, right? How impactful was your mother being a playwright and a director and also your your father being a videographer mm -hmm. on you being a comedian? Well, we was always in, we was always we always had a production. It was always a, a show to do. It was always some film we had to study for. Uh, we would come home from school having homework, and my mother would have a script about this thick where we had to remember these lines for the next you know next show coming up. We're like, man, I ain't even asked for this. Who am I gonna sign and play? No, nah, just your, your name is, is is Spencer for uh, this month, and that you're only gonna answer to that name to get in character. You know what I'm saying? And my dad was the was the guy filming filming everything and. He was the first person in our hood with, with a camera. You know what I'm saying? He had the camera that had the, the VCR with it, that had the battery pack, the, the, the strap around on the shoulder. So, and we, we, he played with that a, a lot. And my mom just was, it was, was the first people with the computer, the IBM computer in the house. And, you know, we always had something to do. It gave us that culture to be ready and on deck for everything. You know what I'm saying? Not only just for uh, her films, but also for her uh, production when she had speakers come in the city that she would, you know, book them to speak like Dr. Uh, you know, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ivan Van Serma, Maya Angelou. I met all of them as, as a kid and didn't even realize how important these people were because I was like working. <laughs> I, was, I was passing off. It wasn't no Instagram or Facebook back then. So the way we had to promote it, it was me and my brother walking from neighborhood to neighborhood, putting flyers out on people's porch and stuff like that and her promoting it to her, our family and, and, you know, and these events was going on all the time with my mother, so I was already, you know, ready for the stage. So it's pretty wild, bro. I didn't, I didn't know you had that type of Pan African background, right? Do you remember some of the scripts or some of the storylines for some of the stories that she wrote? Yeah, there was a a, a play called "To uh, To Be a Slave." She did, and it was like on some Jumanji type stuff. You know what I'm saying? I played different roles in it, and then once I, I got older, I wasn't in it, but she kept it going. And "To Be a Slave" is so dope because like it was like like a chest that was open and then slavery reopened. And like on Jumanji, how all the animals and stuff come out, all the slave masters and all this, it came back out around these kids that, that the grandmother had this old chest in her house. Really deep play, man. Um, that was like one of her best, that's my favorite of hers. Um, the, the, uh, the winning pitch was another one of her plays where it takes place on a baseball field. So like, it, if, she, if she would have it in a church, both sides of the, I don't know, I forgot the names. What you call the chairs? The pews, both pews, right? The whole church was set up like a baseball field. So you got first and second base on these, on these ends. You know, I mean, first and third, and second base was here. So you're, you're not only watching the play in the front, you're watching, you're inside of the, you're in the game. You know what I'm saying? And uh, each, each player was a person in the Bible. And she like had the realm of each person's story. Like Joe would get up there, and John, and and, and Jesus, and it was it was very creative, man. And I, I I remember I forgot what boy I was. I think I was uh, David. I think I was David on one like David and Goliath, and Dave and Goliath was pitching. It, she really was creative with it, man. You know what I'm saying? That was like my second favorite joint. Um, it's another one where uh, it was a um, a girl that worshipped the devil. She did this in church too. People was like, my, my pie crazy. But she did a whole bunch of those different types of, of plays. And I just, you know, I don't remember the scripts exactly. I just remember the vibe and some of the titles of all of them. If I see them again, I will remember them. But yeah, she still does them. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about your comedic journey, but I believe it officially started around 2003. Mm-hmm. Straight. I think around, around LeBron first year. All right. Cool. So <laughs> I always always line my career up with his, like what he was doing and what I was doing. But that's when I like first, first got on stage. Um, comedians, we always started as, you know, I always wanted to do this, but we don't know how far it's going to get. Yeah. I've always been a fan of comedy because of my dad, you know what I'm saying? He always, you know, kept us, and that him downstairs smoking weed with his friends, they down there listening to Richard Pryor albums and Red Fox albums, Bill Cosby joints, and me and my brother, we were upstairs like sneaking, listening, and, and we always laughed at the appearance of comedy and, and people's voices. When you're a kid, you automatically laugh at the ignorant stuff they say and, and their demeanor. But when you, when you get older, you really appreciate the actual material and the journey they take you on through these different stories. So I've always had a comedic background, but I never thought that I could just get on stage and do it. It's always that part. All right. I just, um, the, <laughs> the part I want to ask, right? Um, can you tell me how the legendary comedian Tony Woods inspired you to pursue comedy oh, professionally? Man. Tony Woods, he don't even realize it. He was the first person I saw like live in front of me doing comedy. 
and he was having so much fun. That was like the first time, like, because the restaurant that I was in that night when I first saw him, it's a restaurant downstairs and the comedy club was upstairs. And I didn't even know that there were places to go to do stand up. I thought you had to, like, me and Purge, my, my running mate, my, my, when the guys on tour with me, we always talk about, we always felt, felt like you had to know somebody to get into comedy. Like, I had to know, you know, D.L. Hughley or know, you know, you know, Steve Harvey or something to get grandfathered in. Like, he cool, let him get on stage. I didn't know there was open mics or showcases. So, me at that restaurant, I heard laughter upstairs and I just kind of creeped up there. And it was, a, it was a open mic, it was an open mic contest and Tony Woods was doing stand-up while they tally up the votes. So he was just getting in some time, just, you know, and I'm, I'm sure they were paying him, but he was just like doing the stand up at the end of the, con uh, at the, end of the contest while they tally up all the votes for that round. And he was just having such a good time, man. And I just remember him like just, just screaming and laughing and, and the crowd was laughing. He, and I was just like, I would like to try that one day. And, and, and like a week later, I just did my research and then got myself into the contest. So him, him being the first person I've ever seen, he was the first person I've seen live. And it was perfect because he was just really killing it. And I was just like looking at him and looking at the crowd like, it's, everything he's saying is hitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to Tony Woods. Have you been able to tell him that story? Yep. I told him that and he, he was like, I'm glad I inspired you. That's, 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 just that your career is because of me. And he just, and we laughed it off, man. But it's cool to how I ended up really getting to know the people I looked up to and being in showcases with them and being a it just It's such a, a, a great feeling, man, that you look up to these people and now they become the people that you run with in these shows. Please tell us a story about you being fired from Sprint before you became a teacher. Man, that was like the time where it was like tree shaking time when you was like, bro, something got to change because uh, you get tired of like waking up. My rule is if I get up too many times in the morning, looking at myself in the mirror saying, I, I'm, I'm not happy with where I am. If that happens too many days in a row, in a week or so, something in my life got to change. And after a while, to be honest with you, I stopped like caring about work because I latched onto the script idea I had just for this, for this sitcom I wrote. It's called The Transfers. It was about like a cell phone store and all these characters in the cell phone store was hella funny because I worked at Sprint. So it was like, I can't do nothing. My mother was like, all the stuff you're stressing about, you need to be writing about this. This is material. You keep complaining to me. This is funny material. So I started writing the script at my desk every day and I stopped caring about working. Yeah. So I would email myself. I would be writing. I wrote uh, 12 episodes in a week. That's how focused I was. I was latched on because I had so much experience in it. And customers coming in, I'd be right with you, right with you in a minute. I wasn't hitting quota. Yeah. I was doing stuff wrong. I was like hooking people up by accident. Like, you know, a little buyback program, you get your phone back to somebody and you sell it back, you put it on their bill. I was just like, yeah, whatever. I was just, people was like, I'm going to Desi because he's going to get something wrong because I know this one ain't worth as much money. And I stopped paying attention. And then I got caught up because I, was, I wasn't hitting my quota too many times in a row. And then called me in the office to do it, to, to you know, get fired. You know what I'm saying? But one of my coworkers was like, you always, when you, you, you always silence the kids when you come in here for some reason. That's like, I feel like kids is your calling, like something around children because you make them laugh. You know how to make them like be quiet in the store because they be stressing their parents out. And my, one of my friends was like a part-time um, substitute teacher. And then she gave me the information for that after I had like a whole depression area around that time after I got fired from Sprint because no job and you just like trying to figure it out. And um, I started subbing at different schools. I got banned from one school because um, I was, <laughs> I don't know if you got time to hear that. I got banned because this middle school, they lied to me. Because as a sub, you don't know you about to go to a certain school till literally like midnight. So at midnight you get that call like, you gonna be at Cranbridge <laughs> teaching science, get ready. And the one school I went to, they lied to me, yo. They was like, all right, you gonna be teaching karate class, not karate class, uh, some type, some subject, and they ain't had no chairs or nothing in the room. There's no desk, no nothing. It's just mats in the room. I was like, it was like, I think it was like some kind of yoga or some type of, I was like, what do y'all be doing here? And the kid was like, yeah, we be playing pin the mat. I said, what's, what's pin the mat? It's like when we try to pin each other. And it was literally wrestling. And I was like, all right, well, two people show me how you do it. And they were trying to paint each other. And then fast forward, I'm in there like, you're next against you. You lost, sit down. Nope, you. And kids were going to the office, like, like with knots on their head, busted lips. The nurse came to the room like, what the hell is going on in here? I'm like, what are you talking about? These kids are coming to my office bleeding. 
And it was like, yeah, don't send him no more. I'm saying it's like, cause he got the kids in the school fighting. And then when I got to the office to get, you know, whatever paperwork so I could leave, one of the kids was sitting there with an ice pack on his head, like, yeah, Miss Desi, we don't, we don't ever do that. <laughs> I'm like, he's like, they, they lied. I'm sorry. I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm sorry for you. You the one with a knot on your head. So the school I got, uh, they kept me at, I was like really popular with the kids and the staff. Within like two, three days of me being there, I was like the only black teacher. And I was just being real creative with my lessons. And it was like, the company you work for is about to, you know, about to shut down your half. So you ain't, you ain't you're gonna be just waiting again for sub jobs. So if you wanna work here permanently, you can if you want. And I was like, yeah, let's go. And then they hired, they hired me through another company and I stayed there for the whole five years I was there. Yeah. All right. And um, <laughs> yo, the vibe as a teacher, right? How did you balance? teaching and performing at night that was like superman and clark kent i had to i, I had the kids call me mr desi because i didn't want them like looking up my stuff look and i still did stand up of course every every night hitting the clubs and and going back and forth to new york little short trips dc here and there you know and teaching helped me as a comedian because keeping the attention of adults is easy but being creative to keep the attention of children is like one of the hardest things you can do if you're not creative. You're just talking and they're just looking at you like, all right, this guy ain't talking about nothing. City kids, you know how city kids can be. And it's like, I had to like, uh, just talk about my lessons. Like it just happened to me in my life. I, as long as I involved it in something in my childhood that helped me, they would perch up and listen. You know, and no matter, and I had to make my own subjects. I was like the resource teacher, so I would make my own subjects. I was social awareness and computer class, um, and I had gym too. So I would just teach them these lessons, and they were really like I would teach about like astronomy and all kinds of stuff, like like um, the medical field, and I would dress like my lessons sometimes. So it really made them pay attention. So that really helped my creative side of stand up and being able to like fight through people not paying attention because them kids they just like the one minute they looking at you, the next minute they just like. Squirrel, they just lay somewhere else. And they really appreciated it, man. So by the time I had left, I realized like these kids really, and the parents, they really loved me to death, man. You know, so they keep, it's, a lot of them still keep in contact with me today. You know, and they, they really proud of me. A lot of them like, damn, Miss Liz, you really left. Like, you wasn't playing this shit, man. Like, you really fucking left. And the lady that was after me was just like, they was like, yo, she got some, some tough shoes to fill, man. Cause she just come in the room like this, this bitch just come in the room and just put ditto sheets on the table, man. She don't even do what you be doing, you know, like. And the last day I quit, I threw my hat. I normally when I come in the room, I would throw my hat on the little little rack and I would get started. And I walked into that last middle school class and I and it was like, You gonna throw your hat, Mrs. Des? They would like wait for me to throw my hat to see if it catch. And if I if it didn't, they would all laugh. If it did like, oh, but this time I walked in, I didn't throw my hat. And it was just like, You ain't gonna throw your hat, Miss Des? I was like, It's my last day, man. They was like, Why would you stop playing, Miss Des? Whatever. I was like, I was like, no, I'm serious. And it was like, you ain't gonna throw your head? I was like, no. And like within like three seconds, it was like, he's serious. They get mad at and they all got bro. up, all of them just started hugging me like, no, man, oh, we would have been down, man. And I felt like, dang, bro, I'm about to leave all my kids, man. You know what I'm saying? Why, why did you leave? Because I felt like uh, I, I had hit cities on my own. I like maxed out all my bread. I took all my credit cards. I had plane tickets, hotels, LA, Atlanta. New York, I'm just going to these places. I'm staying for like a week at a time, like taking my vacay and just going. And it that sacrifice, I was going broke doing it, but that sacrifice was probably the best thing that ever that I did for myself. I knew I was going to be in a hole, but I knew my my mother said, you got to let your gift give you room. Just, I, my mother would normally give me responsible advice. <laughs> but my mother at this time, she's like, Desi, you are handsome, you are funny, you are talented. Fuck school, fuck them kids. They be all right, they gonna grow up, they gonna lead lives. But now, it, I feel like now, it's just this energy, I just feel like it's time. And when I took all them credit cards and just like, you know, just maxed out on everything, I took my brother with me, we went to all these, I would call, I called a hella clubs and, and, and comics and promoters. And a lot of people said no, but a lot of people said yeah. And the ones that said yeah, man, you know, they that mad the relationship. I still got them relationships to, to this day because I took a chance and they took a chance on me. And you know, me me leaving, I had to. I, I got tired of telling them follow y'all drinks when I get older. 
because you don't want to be mad at yourself or feel like I didn't give him my all. And I felt like now I have to show, I can't just keep saying it, now I got to show them that I'm dead serious about following your dreams. So y'all got to watch, I follow my lead. And I, I, can, I may not reach all of y'all, but a lot of them it did. A lot of them was like, man, they still be texting me. Some of them grown, some of them still like probably middle school now. It's weird seeing the ones that's so little and now they just like got mustaches and stuff like that and deep voices. And they were like, yo, you really like was dead serious about that, man. And, they, and by the time I was about to quit, they started finding me. They found out my last name. So they started looking up my my social media. It was like, Miss Desi be cussing you over. You should look at this shit. I'm like, yeah, I got to go soon because now it's starting to fade. <laughs> so, but yeah, man. Um, all right. As a former teacher, right? Mm -hmm. I wish you said it's very true, too, because I think a lot of times with the kids that it doesn't resonate that they don't see you chasing your dream and you're telling them to chase their dream. Mm -hmm. I think most teachers teach by default. There's very few teachers who teach because they want to teach. Mm -hmm. Those who teach you want to teach don't stay that long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like my personal experience. Mm -hmm. But um, in regards to teaching, why do you think it's such a crisis? Why do you think people can't last in the classroom? Uh, I think you out. some of us outstay our welcome. Some of us are genuinely there for the kids, we love what we do, and teachers don't get enough money. Teachers should be getting NBA contracts. The stuff they gotta deal with, the money they, they'll be, I realize the money we put in to, to decorating our rooms, to, to keeping these different uh, forms of organization to make it fun and learn. Teachers do not get enough credit, man. Emotionally, financially, they don't get enough credit, bro. But teachers, I feel like, we don't stay long because you really, sometimes you realize your worth or you get too stressed out or you realize you're just spinning your wheels or you just feel like a next phase is coming. I feel like if they did get NBA contracts, it'd be teachers to be out here just like really like, you know, like getting interviews after the, after the class, like this third grade was tough today, but uh, I gave my all 100%, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I feel like teachers need more money, man. You know, and a lot of them quit because like they, they and then and nowadays we starting to see them get treated crazy. You be seeing these videos, these kids be slamming the teacher and pepper spraying them. Why are they doing what? I, like, as a kid, I was so afraid of even disrespecting the teacher because I knew my mother was going to whip my ass. You know what I'm saying? Even as a, I'm bigger than my mother in 12th grade, I'm still scared of my mother to this day. But these kids, man, be getting my phone and punching teachers and stuff. It's just not, it's just not the same. And I feel like a lot of teachers feel like they're risking a lot, you know, and eventually they be like, nah, I know my worth. I got to go. Cause I'm in that fucking somebody child up. <laughs> so, but yeah, man. How important is the audience and the successful execution of a joke? Mm. The audience is. That's why I tell artists a lot of times that. Cause I started in the in the uh, in the art community on the poetry and nights and music. Cause there wasn't a lot of open mics in Baltimore, so I would I would lie and say I'm a poet and go to open mics and get on stage and just tell jokes. And they'd be like, When is this nigga gonna do a joke? When is this nigga gonna tell us a poem? <laughs> so. I started in that in that era of the neo soul, you know what I'm saying? That's why that 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 community loved me to death. And I feel like as comedians we have it harder because we need the audience, you know, and we need that 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 feedback to let you know like we're feeling you or you funny, you know what I'm saying? But I I had a talk with funny. I had a talk with Scrappy. He was like, "Nah, bro, it's not like that." You know, Scrappy funny as hell too. Scrappy was like, "It's kind of the same, bro, cuz you can be performing your ass off and they just staring at you." But at the same time, I'm still nigga, you got music. You love your music. You know what I'm saying? I can't tell my joke and laugh at my own damn joke. <laughs> I can't be telling them like, ha ha, y'all ain't get it. All right, next joke. But with us, we need the crowd to, to feel us because we like really being vulnerable up there. You know, and your material is just, you're just giving your all. And your material, you're just hoping that this, this works. You just really know this is funny to you. And it's a magic we have as comedians to be able to say something to people that I find funny, and I know I'm make you laugh with it, and I got the courage to say it, and I don't even know you, and I know, I know you're gonna laugh at this. Comedians are unique because this is one of the few professions where you're by yourself. Like with sports, you have a team. Mm -hmm. Even like on single sports, you still have like a team there. Yeah. I noticed with music artists too, a lot of musicians are shy, well, singing artists, they're shy, and it makes sense yeah. because they, they have the band behind them. How is it going out there like by yourself? Like there's no backup, bro. There's no help defense. There's no nothing. There's no play calling. <laughs> I always say it's just like when you remember the, uh, on Hangover when Allen was, was putting all the math problems together. And that's how comedians are. We are literally sitting there fearing for our life. We're happy to be there. We're still nervous. We're trying to put together what jokes are going to fit at what time. Because sometimes you can have a whole 
set lineup, but you can look at me. I like to sit in the audience for a while and sneak in the back and kind of look at people and get the energy of the room. Like I'm soaking in everybody. So when I get up there, I already know how they feel and what the vibe is. But that don't work all the time. So sometimes you just really gotta like be in the moment. Sometimes you be like, yo, set me going one way. You be like, uh, then I feel in this whole realm and topic. Let me change my tone and go to these jokes, my backup joints. So that's that's you know that's it's it's the science behind it when you up there, man. It ain't gotta be that hard, but to me, it's it's simple when you just know how to you know work a room. You know what I'm saying? And can sense energy. And like, how quick do you switch? Like I know in reggae it's different with R&B and different genre. I know with reggae artists, the good ones, if a song's not hitting, they just stop the song and go to the next one. Oh wow, that ain't dang. Yes, yeah, so you got to see. You do it's that. A, it's a unique thing. Like if if the crowd's not going crazy, you know, they just cut the song. I just realized twenty seconds into it and go because you be one, you be feeling it. You be like, why you cut it off? They be like, not enough people's feeling the shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but move like, on. as a comedian, like you can't cut in the middle of a joke. Oh man, so, you like, can't. If you're bombing, you got to sit there and finish the joke, bro, and mm -hmm. do it. You, you start it off, you be like, this is not going to end well. If they didn't laugh at this, I know they ain't going to laugh at it, but I already started the story. So I got to I gotta land this plane. It's going to crash and burn, but I got to land it. So, yeah, man, that's that's literally how it is. But I ain't know that, man. No, the good ones, they, they really do. Mm -hmm. um, Sizzler, Boja Banton, they're very good. Mm -hmm. And they be they bangers. They be like, I know they're going to feel this song. And they don't, they be like, they look at these like. <laughs> All right. Um, speaking of audiences, you touched on it a little bit, right? But um, how do you know what jokes to say where and what jokes not to say at certain venues? Mm. Um, it's kind of like, like I say, like you say, like sitting in the, sitting in the crowd, kind of, kind of vibing out with people. But also, when you get on the road, you you learn to make yourself marketable across all mark all markets, so that you as a person, they love you. So man, no matter what you say, they just want to hear what's next in your life and whatever you're going to joke about because you're just giving your version of whatever's happening because they all been through what you've been through. That's why they're there. But as you grow old, as you grow in comedy, you start to get so good that people just want to hear your, your version of whatever you're talking about. Um, as long as you're not too abrasive or if you know if you are abrasive, that's what they come for. It's just really knowing that now this is my my cadence, you know what I'm saying? You're going to laugh at whatever I'm saying anyway, because this is like what you come to see some jokes. But yeah, like that's that's, a, that's a, that was a good question. You really just gotta, <laughs> you really just gotta be in the moment I mean, within seconds. Because I I've done a show, like I had a show in Vegas. That's why I never get too cocky with it. I had a show in Vegas, and and they had a this is like one of them joints. It was in a casino, can't see nobody in the audience, and they got the clock right there. I had 30 minutes. And as soon as the show started, I started doing my material and it just wasn't hitting them like it normally does because I had such high energy getting on the stage. And I was like, the first one ain't work, then another joke, pace across stage. That one ain't work. I was in my mind, what in the fuck is happening right now? And I looked down and I saw a 28. I was like, Jesus, <laughs> it felt like an hour. That clock right there, I was just like, damn. And then I like, that's when I learned to like focus on like somebody in the audience sometimes because sometimes in big rooms you can't monitor the laughter. You gotta look at somebody and talk to them. And I, I realized it was, it was an old white people, just an old white couple. And I was like, oh, let me slow down and go back to my teaching jokes, because the old, older folks love the teaching jokes. And so that's when you have to circle around and kind of like be in the moment and think quick. Because I didn't know I was talking to a whole bunch of old ass gambling people. You know what I'm saying? That's when I saw that little old white people. I was like, oh, okay, all right, I'm jumping here on some, you know, people in my era shit. I gotta lead them into it by starting with the kids and the family and shit and then get into who I am so they can kind of all circle back around and relate. So, yeah. How does your spouse, family, and friends respond when you make jokes about them? Mm, my wife has uh, become very comfortable because she know I'm not doing anything out of malice and I don't use her just for as much as material as I can. She's, she's, she's way... Uh, she helps me with a lot of stuff, man. She make me realize a lot of the a lot of the material. She's not like sitting there like literally writing jokes for me, but that's what she wanna take credit for. But it's always the small stuff she say that make me notice, to make me elaborate on that become bigger and bigger jokes. You know, the f jokes with her, with, with her and her friends and her family and I pick up on that. I be like, you know what, I ain't even noticed that. And that, that, that small, it's always something real small that she say that makes me like elaborate a lot on and makes me better as a comedian. But as far as my family and my friends and stuff like that, uh, my family is, uh, is very proud of me. They're very supportive. Um, they let they love coming to, to see the live home shows because they've supported me throughout my whole career, and they love seeing the group. Like last night, I had a lot of my cousins come out, 
and they just was like, and we had, we had, we had a show in Philly, and they just be like looking like, dang, bro, like, and during all this fun time we was having partying, I was still doing the open mic thing. And they're so proud because it's like, yo, bro, you really had like a work ethic to you. Like, you even though you still party with us and had fun with us, you still was doing the open mics back then and getting better and better, man. So it, it inspires them. It really, you know, makes them, you know, want to do better for themselves. And that's a, a lot of the motivation for me to to keep doing it, you know. I want to jump back to the wife. It seems like she's very observant in mm -hmm. regards to things. Yeah, yeah. she's very observant. Um, she she gets nervous for me when I have home shows. It's like she get nervous, like she about to get on stage. I'm like, nigga, you ain't doing nothing. Um, but she's always is really proud of me, and I always ask for her feedback because I don't want her to ever like not be turned on by me as a stand-up comedian. Because I've been to uh, you know shows with with my OGs, and some of them like like uh, you you be sit there with them and watch them on stage headline as comedians. We like I look up to this guy. Comedy is comedy. We love just seeing our comedians, our, our OGs eat. We love seeing them on stage eating and killing. And I remember watching one of my uh, you know. Uh, OGs doing this thing and his wife was sitting there just like like just and she was saying his jokes while he was saying them and she was just like ready to go I don't ever want my wife to be like that I, I, she don't go to every show but even still I don't ever want her to be like just looking at me like alright nigga get it over with you know what I'm saying I still want her to feel how inspired I am every time I get on stage and really still be sitting there like not more so a groupie but just so proud of me so I always ask for her feedback you know and she, she always give me my emotional part of it's like I can tell you was nervous on this part or I know you want this to be better or she's never judging it but she's more so like I like I, I, I like Ryan. how you switch that up yeah she always yeah. like I like how you switch that part up and you you change the tone of your voice so yeah how did you link up with just hilarious oh man sis my big sis little sis um love her to death man um she took on me she took on being around me because I had like a genuine vibe for wanting to see her get better and I feel like uh, she she felt like we both felt like um, a lot of people were trying to take advantage of the moment. Um, you, you started to, you started to see her momentum gravitate, and she was just her charisma, her style, the social media, everything was all working. You know what I'm saying? Back when she had like 55k, and back in that time, you could be hosting parties <laughs> with 55k. You know what I'm saying? And I will always give all those gems that I learned. Cause not a lot of OGs gave me shit. You know what I'm saying? Cause they was trying to get the, on their way up and trying to eat. So it was hard to kind of, you know, get gems and, and information when they were still on their come up shit. And time started moving faster and faster as far as social media catching up with stand up. And I would always give her a little gems and, and just uh, motivate her. Even cause sometimes she would go to shows sometimes and just write. She would just go to some shows and just sit around us and kind of like look at the the bullpen of comics talking. But I will always make time to talk to her on the side about stuff. And I didn't want nothing but her success, to see her shine, to see her, because I always feel like we can't take away from each other. And I would, you know, help, of course, tune stuff up as far as material. And um, she would notice that I just had a genuine love for comedy. And she would have, once, once she started getting the momentum on her, on her video, she's like, I really want to get better at stand up. And she would do her open mic thing, started to build up on her set. And she had started to have her own shows and she would host them and she would call me to headline. And I said, I will do it for free because this is around the time I'm teaching. I'm stressed from these children. <laughs> I have man material. And I would say, I would do it for free, y'all. Cause she was like, I ain't got all the bread for such and such. He want this, he trying to hit me over the head with this. I'm like, bruh, I will, I will do it for free. You know what I'm saying? Just let me come through. And she would, you know, have, she would host. And it's funny how she would host. She built her setup by hosting, getting on and off stage. So when you bring people up, you got time to go, no, I can change that to that. But so when you just doing one set, you just got one time to fix something. Whereas over her, she was getting on and off stage, fixing this, fixing that. We would have these conversations. And she always appreciated just me doing that for her. And so when I run the tail end of me still like on my grind, I was like in and out of not teaching, but I was just like a behavior specialist in school. So I was kind of doing side jobs around that time. I was uber lifting and just doing side jobs. You know what I'm saying? I was doing anything. I just need some bread. My child on the way. I got, I'm about to just, and Jess was like, yo, you about to start having to quit all that stuff because once I hit the road, you're going with me. And I was just like, I appreciate you saying that, you know, because mad comedians tell you that. <laughs> I was like, you know what? That's, that's, the, that's the highest compliment of all compliments you can get. But I know this is probably like what happened because I got to get it on my own. And once she booked them dates, she was like, oh, we all on the East Coast first. And I did a show with her in D.C. at the Improv. She's like, can you do 30 minutes? I was like, 
more than anything in the world. <laughs> I've been waiting for the end of the pack show and I ripped, man. And she was like, yo, when I hugged her, come to the stage, she was like, I want you to do that everywhere I go. And she did her thing and I was just like, all right. And that's when I quit all my other stuff and it just focused on like more so helping her write with her jokes and focusing on my set, so yeah. And what has impressed you the most about her? Uh, her ability to bounce back, man. She, I've always had her back, but her ability to to take the bumps and bruises that social media has with doing the, the, the cancel culture. And when she went through her situation, I was always there beating over the head with, don't stop, you have to bounce back. Like, it's, it's, and she was just going through it, man. That's never why she always so protective of me. Cause during that cancel culture crap that she went through, she was really like doubting herself and it was just a mistake and she was just doubting because there's so many, so many people just feed off the negative stuff more than the positive stuff, man. People don't even see the positive shit she was going. In every city she was going to, she would hire like five or six people from that city, put money in their pocket. That's one of the best things you can do. It's give, hire somebody to make money for themselves and put them out there. The first two, three years of the tour, she was doing that in every city we went to. Hairstylists, nails, emulate all that. She would do that. People don't even know she was doing that, but the negative shit gonna pop off first. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I admire that she didn't back down. And I admire that she's able to take on all of this and she still wants to be a good mother. Just like how I wanna be a good dad, she don't play about that mother shit. You know what I'm saying? Like when she come home, she is a full on mom. She will discipline the hell out of uh, Ash. And it's been, it's been time, it'd be funny, yo. Like we, like even when she was on rail, I'll never forget like one of these sitcoms, she had me come out to you know LA and you know uh, be with Ash and chill with her on the set and you know just on, in Warner Brothers Studios just being on the, on the lot is amazing. But she still was a mom. She didn't care. Like Ash was in there acting a fool. You know kids, Hollywood kids don't realize this is a privilege and they start being little assholes. <laughs> so Ash was being a little asshole this day, and she could see he was being an asshole while she's acting, bro. She's literally in a scene. And I could, she wasn't like getting off character, but in between cuts, I would see her like, yeah, we're gonna change this. And then I would see her looking up in the stands where we were. And I'll never forget when it was introduced us at the end of the show, at the end of the episode, it was like, at, you know how, how you know, sitcoms do that, like, hey, give it up for the, and everybody clapping. And just, they said, good, just learn. She started clapping, like, yeah, thank you. Sit your ass down. <laughs> Nobody peeped it but me, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But yeah, man, her adversity, man, she, she gonna fight, man. So that's where she, where she is today, so. Hey, what do you think about this notion that you need to be screwed up mentally or emotionally to be a comedian? You need to be what up? Screwed up emotionally, screwed up emotionally. or mentally to be a comedian. What's I your hate, thoughts about that? I hate that, that bro. Please speak about that. Because I feel like comedians are some of the most brilliant minds. I feel like comedians are some of the most kindest people. They're all some shitty ones. They're all some, some, some fake ones. They're all some people that, you know, <laughs> you know we talk about all the time. <laughs> They're all some people that just you can't do business with. You can't, you know, that's just, but that's just people. You know, I had, a, I had a chick I was dating one time, her parents told her, be careful with, they would hear a comedian, be careful, because you know, comedians are very depressing. They're very sad people. No, we're not, bro. You know what I'm saying? Before you continue, is the mm -hmm. origin of that, is it like a, because, like a Richard Pryor vibe where they just focus on these big names that have yeah. certain issues and they put it on everybody else? I think that's what it is, man. I really do. I think they just look at the big names who went through their trauma, which everybody goes through, and they just said, that's how all comedians are. They're trying to mask their emotions by be, being funny. And most of the time, it's not even that. A lot of times, we're trying to heal other people, bro. Like, we heal ourselves through comedy. There have been times I've been going through so much stuff, and people, and as comedians, as men in general, they don't, nobody check on us. Nobody asks us to be all right. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's saying, what you gonna do? They see us, they see us, but they don't see us, bro, because we're supposed to protect everybody, and that's kind of the shield we put on. But as comedians, we self heal. I always tell comedians we are superheroes, bro, because we self heal. We don't have time. We don't have time to sit and mope around. We literally have to get up here and put on a smile and make everybody laugh. And it's like we we surgically heal ourselves because we put so much time into being funny and formulating jokes because we know I'm going to heal somebody in this crowd. Somebody going to see this joke. Somebody going to hear this joke. And they went through this, and they going to look at it like, you know what? It's not even that bad. If this nigga can laugh about it, I know I can get through it. You know, and that stigma, man, is, is crazy. Cause like I said, that girl was like, my mom said, I gotta be careful with you cause you're really depressing. I said, bitch, have I ever been, have I done anything depressing to you? You know what I'm saying? I haven't met too many comedians that are going through it. Some do hide it well, some do hide what they're going through well. Um, but that's why the people I rock with as far as comedians, even even if we see each other far, you know, close, I always, always I'm always willing to check on them. I'm always willing to ask about them cause 
you know, we need that. But a lot of them just are genuinely good people, man, because that that's their gift. That's their superpower. I can make this person laugh and instantly they feel better. But you got to be careful with it, too. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's, it can be a gift and a curse if not usable. So I see why people say that. But most of the comics I've met, man, man, they're just good people, man. You know? So, yeah. What's the, uh, why would you say it's a gift and a curse? What would be the bad side of being able to make people laugh? The bad side of it is not taking you not taking nothing serious. The bad side is you masking a lot of what, what's going on and you're not trying to attack whatever problems going on in your life. You know what I'm saying? Um, you, uh, like, I'm, I'm, it's cause this is kind of mean, any relationship that you're in, don't put yourself in the line of what do you love better? Because you're gonna lose that battle. <laughs> okay, you are outgunned and outmanned. <laughs> don't ever say it's either me or comedy because a comedian will leave your ass because <laughs> they know this got me through so much. This comedy has got me through so much. You're just a person that can just get me through a moment and this com comedy is just such like a, a it, it can be, you can look at it like your child, a, another relationship. Don't put yourself, that's the curse of it all. If, if you put, if a person ever puts themselves in a category like choose, you're gonna lose because comedy has been, got me through more shit than you. I've known comedy before I knew you. That's, I ain't gonna lie, that, I've taken that. I've been that person before, like, bitch, don't you ever, don't you ever talk about comedy, bitch. This is what's gonna put food on our table, bitch. You just gotta believe, you, if you don't believe in this shit, you gotta go, that's fine. Don't ever talk, this is like my, 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 my first child. So that's the cursing it all, you know. And I've seen a lot of comedians do that too. And and we and, and a lot of relationships too, you don't take it as serious because nothing can't hurt me because I got comedy. You know, so but the, the gift of it all is, you know, just being able to heal people, man. And and also, um, like I seen your skits, you touch on a lot of topics of manhood, the struggles of uh manhood. Yes. Have a lot yes. of brothers responded to you because as you said, no one cares about men, right? <laughs> it's just the reality of the situation. But like have uh people reached out to you and responded and, and uh thanked you for touching on those topics? Always, man. I talk to everybody. Everybody, all my followers know I have a conversation going on. I mean, I remember you, but if you talk if you say something that we specifically spoke on in the conversation, I remember you. Cause I talk to everybody, and I th I think that's that's something as that's a responsibility as a comedian man is to, you know, talk to all of our fans if we can. That's just me. Um, I take that to heart because I know there was a time when I didn't have the support, and I know without y'all there is no me. You know what I'm saying? I can be joking all I want, but if y'all ain't fucking watching, it's important and sharing and and you know elaborating and commenting and stuff and liking. There is no me. You know what I'm saying? I still value myself, but. I just believe that entity that I've built in my stand-up, you know, it's because of my audience, man. And guys, it's, it's, I have, of course I have a, you know, more of a woman audience than guys, but the guys that do rock with me, bro, they, they like brothers for life, man, because they really be like, yo, I was going through it. The, they always hit you with that story of what they was going through when you posted something. Or, you, or when, it, it be right on time. They be like, yo, you just, the thing you just posted, my girl did the same thing, or oh, I just had this big mother, she was doing this and that, so. And it's not like I got baby mama drama, but it's something that they remember. It's something that they, you know, can automatically line. And it, it may not even be on your mind. It just be maybe the skit I'm doing for the week or something at the top of the week I wrote. I'm going to do this skit on Tuesday. People sometimes think you really going through that in the moment. No, it's just be stuff I wrote ahead of time that I've had a conversation with my brother or one of my friends or my homeboys, something I saw on social media, on television, and I find it funny and I just give my version of it, you know, so. But shout out to guys that go to comedy shows, man, because you, you're investing in your happiness. You're investing in laughing. Because guys don't go to comedy shows. Guys just end up, most of the guys at comedy shows are there with a woman, because a woman dragged them in there. But the guys that actually go, you're investing in your happiness. It's a part of your therapy. So Why do you think dudes don't go to comedy shows? Because, especially when they wear, I keep telling guys, you're going to meet the, you, it's so many women go to comedy shows. I don't understand why guys don't just, just, even if you don't like the comedian, just go and look at the crowd. I can guarantee you it's 90% women in there, okay? Guys don't go to comedy shows. Somebody's like, I don't want no nigga changing my emotion. <laughs> no nigga, man, I don't need no nigga grown. I'm a grown man. No nigga making me smile. What kind of shit is that? But it's just investing in your happiness, man. I believe, pay them tickets, man. Go to that show. Watch how better you feel after that. And it'll make you want to do something else. And it'll, you'll get some numbers. It'll, make, it'll motivate you to be better because all these women are here and, and they come out looking good. They already laughed. Half the battles already won. They already laughed, had a good time. They can just go to them and say something to them. They in there, you know, the vibe is already there. So they already drunk. 
If you, if you ugly, then you got a better chance. They drunk, they just laughing. All right. Unless they, you know, not that drunk, like, get your ugliest with me. But <laughs> the battle's already halfway won, so, yeah. Where do you find these videos from? These videos where you, uh, uh, what's the proper term? I Again, uh, oh, you mean like the, the content? Yeah, yeah, yeah. saying yeah, stuff yeah. over? Yeah, yeah. Y'all, the, the, my followers, they just be like, yo, you got to joke about this shit. Yo, this shit is mad funny. And other comics may have had their version of it. But my followers just want to hear my version of things sometimes. That's how it is with, with, with your audience, man. Once you build an audience, you speak their language. Most of the time, you say what they want to hear, and it be funny as hell. And we and we talk about. It. Sometimes I don't even post. I don't even post half the shit I'm saying. It's a lot. People, I, my inbox is full of random ass fights, random ass people hurting themselves. People like, yo, please do the version of this joint. Your joint, man, funny. I know you're gonna kill this joint, man. And. That's where they come from, man. It comes from my supporters and my fans who send me stuff. I Cause I'm barely on there just scrolling. Cause you know, we work, we just doing shit. You can't just, we don't have time to just sit like, the only time I'm really scrolling is sometimes if I'm sitting, if I'm watching a game and the commercial come on, I just be like, all right. Then the game come back on, I'm like, all right. Or if I pull up to the house, check my last couple messages and I just get on Instagram and turn around like 20 minutes went by, I'm like, oh yeah, I got the call. So I don't really be scrolling that much, but when I do check my messages, I know a lot of it is business and a lot of it is people reaching out for something. You know what I'm saying? And that's where I find a lot of my stuff. It's stuff that people send me. Yeah. And what's up with the cat? What's the story behind that cat scene? Oh my God, yo. That is so random. Cause this is funny because it happened by accident. We was about to go to David Buster's and my wife, the original video, you can hear Zoe talking in the background while Lauren is putting her shoes on and we're all getting ready to go to David Buster's. And I sat on the step, like, cause as men, we've been ready. <laughs> you know how long it takes? For three girls to get ready. So I'm gonna just sit here and I'll help wherever I can, but you know, I'm sitting there and she's putting Zoe's shoes on. And when I sit on the steps, Khaki always rubs my arm, always walks past me to get my attention. And and I just pet him, or he wants something to eat, or he just he likes to just dive in your way to get your attention. But this time he just rubbed up against me and I like leaned in to see if he was gonna purr on my ear, and he just purred for a little while. And I just stopped. And then I was like the next day I was like, I'm gonna just see if I stitch this together and just say something. And it's literally the same video over and over again, but he's just saying different stuff, man. And people be falling the fuck out off the damn cat. They be like, man, that cat be right, man. They be really acting like, he got, he got a personality. That cat is smart. <laughs> but it's just the same video. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, what's the difference between Desi, who used to perform at Eden's Lounge, mm -hmm. and the Desi now? Oh, man. The Eden's Lounge Desi was like, he was more like, I gotta get up there and just like rip whatever, whoever in here, you know what I'm saying? I gotta look at, I gotta be real smooth with, with it. And like, I just was building to this person. I always, I always build, I was building to this man that I am today, but I knew I was gonna be there. I always was like, Eden's Lounge was like, like the first uh, venue that was just let me perform because they saw I was lying, first of all. Cause that was, that was Eden, it was Organic Soul Tuesdays. And they was just having all these poets come up and talk about just all this tree hugging sandal stuff. And then I get up there and joke around. But after a while, they was like, bro, you mad funny. And we're noticing you're not really, you're not even a poet. So what we're going to do is we're going to let you do your stand up while, we, while the band is setting up we're in between acts. And the difference between those two guys is just like, it's not that much, man. It's just they're constantly believing that the next opportunity is going to come for you to get up there, man. And the Desi now is more, it's more calculated. I'm more you know, uh, like trying to prepare and trying to give every city or every venue their own version of me. Because I believe also, I, I paid attention a lot growing up in comedy. There's two ways, two different ways you grow up. You grow up as a man, you grow up as a comedian too. And I noticed that I always wanted to give every city and every venue their own version of me because I don't want people to come to my show and be like, nigga, you said that in Jersey. Nigga, nigga you said that in Atlanta. I love giving, if you notice my flyers, my artwork, I always try to give a different vibe for every city. I want them to be jealous. Like, oh, you ain't give us the drunk journal shit. Oh, you ain't give us the tired of a dope shit. Every tour has a theme that I try to run with. And I, I realize that it, it makes people realize he got something new rather than he came here, he did that last time. I don't, I don't ever want people to say that. And the one, it's funny because the one time I had, I had a show, I, I was on tour with Country Wayne and Jess in the same year. And I was, you know, whenever, you know, if Jess had a show that clashed with Wayne's, I would always choose Jess. And Wayne was like, I, I understand, brother, I got you. But I had to have a clean set with Wayne and have a dirty set with Jess. And it was like one joke in between those two that I would say, but I, I can make it clean or I can make it dirty. It's like one of my favorite jokes. 
and I had two shows. I had two weekends, and one in Nebraska with Jess and one in Nebraska with Wayne, like maybe like a month apart. And I did one joke that was the same. And this lady did me like, yeah, you was funny with Wayne, but you had said that one joke. Like, Bitch, you went to, f I, was, I was like, you know how hard it is to write a whole different set and have it prepared for y'all asses? Yeah, I told Carlos, he said, man, fuck that fat bitch. Tell her stop coming to your shows, nigga. <laughs> you know how Carlos is and shit. Shout out to Carlos Miller, but yeah, man, just, just trying to keep your wheels spinning and stay as fresh as you can. It's so important in comedy. You can't have your shit be stale. You got to keep your shit new because your audience is always growing and they grow with you. That's what I learned from my OGs, too, is that your audience grows with you, so you got to feed them. You know what I'm saying? Bro, how hard is that, though? Because when I see comedians that come like they're saying the same joke everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. So do you, you do you switch the entire set or how does it work when you go to these different it's, places? It comes, I'm, I'm going to give you some game real quick. So uh, it just comes and you phase out jokes at year by year. So during the year, you'll have a full set, not even in January, just like the top of your quarter of the whole year. And me and Pudge talk about this shit all the time. And just we phase out our favorite jokes because our home run joints, they're the ones that get the crowd going. But sometimes... Some crowds come for that. Some, excuse me, some crowds come for your home run joints. But your fan fans, the one that's on your timeline every day, the, one that, the ones that already buy their tickets as soon as you post it, they like, I want to hear the news. I want to hear what's new because I know you got something for me. I know you got something new. And you owe them that. You know what I'm saying? Some of them people are, I, I, I have been blessed to have a comedically intelligent audience. So they know me so close enough to say, when I start a sentence, they be like, I already know what joke this is. This is, this is my favorite one. Or they're like, all right, nigga. I want to hear the new shit. So, you know, and you phase out as you do your whole set, you start to take out jokes and replace them with this. And if it works, that stays. Then next one, you just keep going as the year go by, phase out that one. If that joke good, it stay. If it was straight, uh uh, it ain't work, take it out, put it in the fixed area. <laughs> then go get another one, put that there. Keep going. Uh, as the year progresses, you start to phase out the jokes that you were doing, like as your tour tour jokes. You know what I'm saying? And then you film a special or whatever, that whole set, you gotta burn it, gotta get rid of it. Can't do them no more. So, and it depends on sometimes the city. Sometimes you may go to a little small city. And like when me and Jess go to, like we're going to Buffalo. We haven't been to Buffalo in I don't know how long. So my set has upgraded so many times within two years. So I can go wherever I wanna go because I have hella jokes that I've said in different years leading up to Buffalo again because we ain't been to Buffalo since this. So this timeline, Everything up, in, is, everything up in here right before Buffalo is new. I mean, to them, because they never heard the stuff I changed it to. So that's why staying fresh is very important. So, bro, what do you write? Jokes like, do you have a, do you have a time period where you write jokes? How, do, how, do you do, how does the creative process work in regards okay. to building material? First, you got to find, I always tell comedians, find your creative space. There has to be the time where your jokes are fresh in your mind and they have to graduate. If you want this to be your living, this is my life, this is my job, so I have to do this. The creative space of writing a premise first, that's anytime. Like you look at my phone, it's just notes. You're just scrolling, scroll. People that I'll be on Instagram, and I'll be in my notes scrolling, because I will have a topic and I write it, topic, boom, put it in bold in my notes. So it's, it's in bold. I know this is a good premise, I know this is a good topic, I'm gonna eat off this joint, but I don't know where I'm gonna go with it first. And that's, that's one notepad. Then the next notepad is, if one day I'm just feeling that vibe and I just start, and I find my creative space when I feel the most, uh, like the, the, the energy is great and the jokes are just flowing, I get into that topic, start writing the head top parts. And then it goes from, do I want to do this as a sketch or do I want to do this as stand up? And sometimes uh, stand up can't do this joke any justice. You have to do the video. You have to see the facial expression. They gotta do the, the voice back and forth and stuff like that. And sometimes you can do a sketch and it does pretty good, but then you be like, oh, I, oh, and I figured out how to take this and turn this into stand up. Like I got a sketch a while back I did about uh, going on, on the guys trip, or actually going on a road trip with the guys. And I, it, it was so funny. I said, I wanna try it out on stage but I want to do it around the girls' trip. And my wife has, you know, has an annual girls' trip she goes on. And it's funny because that joke is about them. And I took that different people that's on the, on, on the guys' trip. That's like one of my favorite jokes I do and on, the, on the road trip. And I took it and kind of took her friends and put them in each of these categories of this joke of the different types of. 
And when I say it on stage, it's always like, every, every comic has their home run joke. It's one of my favorite jokes to do because it's so relatable. Every woman can relate to it. Every guy can relate to it. It's for everybody. So that's how that joke, sometimes your, your sketches will turn into material depending on how you kind of like look at something else and apply it. So that's how my joke. And then it goes from the jokes that, uh, uh, that, that I've jotted down that are kind of like scatterbrained shit. Then it goes to the topic. Then it goes from the topic to I'm a, I'm a slide it in my set in between jokes that already work. So if it don't work, this shit already gonna make y'all laugh. <laughs> Cause if shit go wrong, you be like, all right, I'm gonna go over some shit I already do. So that that and if it does work, all right, cool. It gets to stay. It it graduates into the set. If it's trash, take it out here, work on it a little bit, add something else. So and you get just as as you grow as that year goes, you start to phase out jokes that are old and you know because you don't want people saying you want people paying money for new shit. So they, they get Instagram for free. No, you gonna pay for this motherfuckers jokes. You're gonna pay for the stand up. So um comedians, pirate and lyrics. Is that a, a frequent thing? Yeah, yeah. Um I don't even get mad anymore. I don't I never really got I, I early on you do because you work so hard to build your set. As a young comedian, I used to be furious. But my brother always told me, Desi, you have it to give. You write for other people. It's like it's it's going to happen. People are going to steal from you. People are going to come across the same topics, but nobody can steal you. Nobody can. You can try. You know what I'm saying? But nobody can emulate your personal experience. Nobody can mirror that. They can try their ass off. It just look fake. You know what I'm saying? And luckily, I've been blessed to just have just a. I got ADD. Luckily, I just got that scattered brain to just have a lot of topics to talk about. But it, it, seeing it. And, and going through it is two different things. Cause the first time I saw it, it was a, like where, within the first year of comp when I was on stand up when a guy did, uh, I always forget his, his name, he's a great comedian. Um, and I reached out to him not too long ago and I told him so, and that really bothered me. Like my whole career, it bothered me that this guy was winning in this contest, but using his joke about the shark. It was like about if I go swimming, you know, and the, and the shark uh, eat me, the, the shark wins. It's like, it was like a joke, like a really good joke. And this guy, as in my first year in comedy, he went up there and told this nigga joke word for word. And he, he said this on Bad Boys of Comedy. Like, so I would watch comedy and memorize people's jokes to not only stay away from them, but just look at how much fun they have in putting this joke together. And this nigga was doing it and he was winning in the contest. And I was getting so frustrated about it. I never let that, I never saw that guy again doing stand up, but I never, I always, I never, um, Ian Edwards, that's his name. Shout out to Ian Edwards. Good guy, man. And years later, I reached out to him and told him, like, yeah, people always you know, use that joke sometimes. I don't, I don't. And I realized that you just don't let it bother you. You know what I'm saying? You just keep, you just because they can't mimic you. They can't, you know, it's, it's your true story. So, you know, I always tell comments also, stop watching the people you look up to. After a while, you got to stop looking at them because you'll start emulating them without even trying. You know, and it's not your fault. It's like what you keep, what you keep looking at. So your, that formula, you'll start make, trying to make it work for you. So you got to find your own voice. But yeah, it, it always happens, man. And I hope that people do better, and I hope that they dig within themselves to, uh, you know, to to because it, it it's gonna it it lasts your whole it, it expands your career when you do that because you emulate somebody else. If you sound like this person, I'm just gonna see this nigga. You just sound like him anyway. But people are coming to see you eat. They want to see you do you. So even even with even with the sketches, because nowadays we in TikTok age. Everybody repeating and, and doing the different versions of stuff. So now it's no more as far as social media, but you can tell my version of a video. You know what I'm saying? So I don't, I don't get mad. This is all good. How important is the special? Because I notice comedians that don't have big specials, mm -hmm. but they're super busy. Yeah. Then I notice comedians that have specials. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much they're making off the specials, but it seems like they kind of fade out. Mm -hmm. um, I think the we're in a different time now where specials are dope, but they're not which you need to be solidified as a working comedian. Because every time something happens, every time a new age comes in of, of what it's supposed to be, it changes. You know, like when I first started comedy, I was told you have to move to New York. You have to stay there and do stand up in New York. To where though now, social media has made it convenient for us to blow up in our own cities and still go, to, you still gotta kinda go to New York to kinda get your groundwork, you know, and, and, it's, and it's beneficial to network there too. But you don't have to do a lot of things. So nowadays, the special is just like, because they look. Some people look at it like everybody got special. So specials are not even special no more because they're giving them to anybody, and that's what the that's that's what I listen to people, and they don't even view it because sometimes 
you only got a special because you cool with X, Y, Z, and they got the plug to this network or this company. You know, so you plugged in, and it don't matter because your audience ain't going to ride for you like that. You know what I'm saying? You look at somebody like Country Wayne, his audience ride for him. Somebody like Jess, they, they audience ride for them. They don't even need a special. And I think we feel like sometimes we need to have a special to feel like we're a part of that, you know, that, uh, that not the click, but... Like a validation. Like right? a validation. Like you got that belt. You got that championship belt. And at the end of the day, you don't really need it. But sometimes you got you to gotta put it together, have it, have it on the platform to, for those who haven't come to see you live that still support you and still want to see you. But times is always changing, man. You know, and you got, you got to change with it or it's going to run over your ass. You know what I'm saying? Because me, I, like I said, I didn't want to do videos, bro. I, I wanted to act. But that little in-between video shit, I was just like, because I started in the TikTok age, and that shit was goofy as shit to me. And, they, and, they, and the TikTokers will put comedian in their bio, nigga, you are not a comedian, you just a goofy nigga for seven seconds. And my brother, my brother challenged me, said, yo, if you feel like you can do better, then do better, show them. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, you being on stage is one thing, but you putting out content will travel, it will do the legwork for you that you can't do on one stage. So if you got, and you got hella shit that you've been writing and you can't say all this shit on this stage like every time. So start creating your own, you know, persona and, and, and start t making these videos yours. Learn how to do this on your own. And I think me getting a tripod is what changed all that. Once I got a tripod, I didn't have to call nobody to come out and record for me. I didn't have to worry, I didn't have to do the, the whole lingo of chasing a nigga that has a better following than me or trying to get some help to, to support and they bring up. Once I got that tripod, it was like, the tripod was like, I'm all you need. Let's get to filming. So uh, I want to go into, um, uh, when did you crack the code with that social media thing in regards to um, providing people what they wanted in regards mm. to skits? When did it like click? Because I know you with anything you start, you're trying, you're doing all mm -hmm. you, but when did it click, bro, where it's like you found a formula that works for you mm -hmm. and you could consistently provide stuff to keep people in tune? Mm -hmm. Once I started going on tour and realizing people were recognizing me from a video more than just stand-up. They'd be like, you the guy that did this. Like, I did a teacher video, and it did numbers on Facebook, and I started getting booked as the teacher comedian. They was like, you the guy that did that. Once, you, once people started noticing that, that specific thing, you touched them. I was getting booked for teacher shows. Like, staffs at schools were just booking me. You know, and I was just like, That's, this shit worked. But then again, I was like, I don't want to be known as that teacher comedian. I don't want to just be boxed in that little hole. And I started just doing other stuff. And I started getting more and more consistent and learning our movie and, and adding sound effects and adding other characters that, you know, because I'm doing this myself, so I got to create other characters. And these are all just people in my family, friends and stuff that everybody has around them. So when I realized I cracked that code, it was just like, it, it, after you crack the code, it's just what you got next. You just got to stay consistent. You, like I said, you got to keep feeding your audience and giving them content. So that's when I began to stay consistent and made, it's like you gotta make an agreement with yourself to get up no matter what time that you promise yourself, you know when your creative space is, this is the time I need to create, I need to create, and then my wife, she understood, she would make anybody in the house shut up, go in whatever other room I didn't need to go in to get away from me to do this video real quick. And I got faster with it, I got quicker with the editing so I can go back downstairs and do my family thing, but yeah, once, you, once I realized the consistency that it took, yeah. Well, you see, the, the difference is that, like, you were a comedian first. Mm -hmm. And what's happening a lot of times is that people up here doing skits and trying to be a comedian, yeah. it's not working, bro. It's yeah, two it's different not, animals, you know? I always, yeah, you're, you're a different beast when you when you do stand-up first. And I get that a lot, and I love that compliment. You know, even, like, now I get booked for shows. And sometimes comedians book me, but like, yo, I, I always wondered when, when y'all booked you, yeah, you're going yeah, to put asses in seats, but did he do comedy or did he do the videos first? And we was in New York, the guy was like, once, I, once you, the moment you, start, you started talking on that stage, I was like, he did stand up first. I, I know he did stand up first. And shout out to the comedians who did the videos first that are working towards getting better at, at comics. Because, you know, every time I get on, every time I finish the show that people only saw me on the videos first, they always say, bro, I've seen a lot of comedians come off of Instagram and come here and they do not do well. It don't translate the same. I'm like, bro, you have no idea. I've been doing this shit. I had to do that to get y'all attention to come to a damn show. So, but yeah, shout out to the comics, to, to, the, to the social media comedians who put in that work, because that shit is not easy. Finding your niche on that stage, because you're so used to the instant gratification of the likes and the views 
no, that shit is immediately in the audience, like, we ain't feeling it. Do something else. It, it's immediately in, in stand-up. So, yeah. I got one more question, right? Like, when you're talking to most comedians, like, I played college basketball, right? And I kind of feel a way, you know, like, it's a certain fraternity. Like, you feel a, you almost feel like people are perpetrating, bro. Like, mm-hmm. they didn't put enough work into, yeah. all right, dude. Mm-hmm. So is that the vibe comedians have for these social media people? I think at first it, at first it was. Um, every era of something sometimes gets mad at the younger era because they got it easier and they paved the way for the next era not even realizing you did this to make it easier for them for them to get on don't get mad at them now praise them be a part of be around them get their energy figure out how to stay lit because if you keep thinking your old ass ways is going to continue to work your ass gonna get left behind in the 90s some goddamn way so i realized that early once i started you know just vibing with people man and being on the road you know with just and stuff that you just have to you know just be a good person. It's not hard, man. Just, just have, just, just be able to connect with anybody and, and to find out what's new. Um, I think, I think the, the OGs were uh, that came before us. They had it so hard, man, for them to get on. That's why I always value their presence in my life and what they've done with the Deaf Comedy Jams and the Comic Views. I always, uh, I will always give them shout outs and show them love and show my utmost respect because they had it way harder than us. You know, they, it's like they had it easy and hard. Because like them, them having a, a, a hot seven minutes on on Def Comedy Jam, next minute they they in movies. You know what I'm saying? You look at somebody like Chris Rock. I mean, not Chris Rock, Chris Tucker. You had that hot eight minutes on there, and then blew up. That was their version of going viral. And to, whereas though to us it may look easy, it may sound easy, but it was hard as shit to get that seven minutes crafted for the crowd to be perfect. That Bernie Mac, that's that five, that famous five minutes Bernie Mac had. That shit took time to be perfected, to make that crowd laugh like that. And, and, and the crowd made that so much better to where so now some of the OGs feel like, nigga, I had to go do this, I had to go ahead and go, and now you just make a damn video and you're famous. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sure in the future, there'll be some, there'll be the new era and then the niggas from the social media era. I had to post, I had to get that camera and I had to edit all this shit for this video to be a little viral. So I think every era, of every class, you know, it's kind of mad at the at the younger generation for like getting that shit quicker. You know what I'm saying? So obviously, uh, you're very uh, determined, right? Um, and you have the ability to bounce back. Yes. How do you? How have you maintained focus and not be burdened by discouragement mm-hmm. during your journey? Because I know it's a lot of ups and downs and disappointments. Yeah. How do yeah. you like continually get up, stay focused, and continue to work? Because I just want to say this before you answer. Yeah. What I noticed with progressive people, the difference is that working at that same level consistent, consistently when nothing's going on, bro. It's periods where, like, nothing's going on. Mm-hmm. But to consistently maintain that certain level of work, mm-hmm. how are you able to do that? Good question. Um, my motivation I have uh, for I know who I'm doing this for. Um, I have a, a standard I set for myself. I have a lifestyle I like to live. I have people that look up to me, people that look, you know, to me for inspiration. Not even just more so fans, my, my family. I, I think of my legacy in comedy. I think of this statue that I've built. Um, and when I when it's all said and done, no matter how I'll, I'll have that body of work that people could look to, it was like he never stopped. He never, you know, he never like, like just, he, he never allowed life to get in the way of living. That's my main lesson. You cannot let life get in the way of living. All the stuff that happened to us, all the fucked up stuff, good or bad, whatever, we can't allow it to dictate who we are as people. And I want people to take my comedy as that. You know what I'm saying? Because people have no idea the shit I be going through, through stand up. And I have been through a lot. And even in my first year of being on the road in 2018, people find that as the year that I blew up because I was getting on the road, but that was the worst year of my life mentally because so many changes were happening. I had Zoe at the end of 2017. I got a fucking newborn. I'm not getting regular people sleep. I'm getting infant sleep. You know what I'm saying? I'm on, I'm on tour. The pressure of being around her and, and writing for her. And I'm, I'm, this is my first time in my life. I'm catching planes like this. Um, the, the content, trying to stay consistent with my content, trying to uh, fucking audition for other shit, trying to still be the actor. I was going to school full time. Bro, I school, was bro? wildin'. I was, I was in school for early childhood education. I was still in school. So I was getting off of planes, going to fucking class. People don't have no idea I was going to do all this shit. 
I was still mentoring, I still mentor to this day. I mentor a lot of the boys in Baltimore. Um, being a new dad, gearing up to be a, a husband, and, um, first time living with a woman, all of this shit was going on, so mentally I was fucked up. Not, in, not, not more so in a negative way, but just the anxiety. A lot going on. And a lot going on, you know? And I had to really like start letting shit go uh, that, that is, is, is taken away from me being the, the greatest comedian I can be. So I had, to, I had to drop out of school. I had to like drop one of the uh, you know, mentoring situations I was in with the, with the young guys. They all understood. They all saw that, bro, you've been working for this X amount of years, bro, so go. You know what I mean? But I had a teacher that said the same thing. When I told him I did stand up and my, one of my psychology teachers. And, you know, we always talk, but it was the worst year for me mentally, bro. I was having fucking panic attacks, you know, suicidal thoughts, not even thinking of killing myself, but just being, just understanding like why, people, why people kill themselves. I was understanding, like, and it's, that thought alone was scary enough to fucking, to mess with you. Like, I see why motherfuckers kill themselves. Cause that, cause you, cause you want to end that feeling of anxiety. I'm talking about heavy shit. You know what I'm saying, and and having to like a lot of times I spent a lot of time alone still because I was still f uh, not finding myself, but really having the time to like not worry about anybody just being in a hotel like waiting for shows and stuff. Like that. I really had the time to really think, and as creative sometimes you think too much, so I really had to like focus in on finding peace and finding you know different things to to be grateful for along the way, the small goals that you can appreciate, and just really like. Uh, Finding out um, uh, like how much I can take as a man, and you know, realizing, bro, like you're gonna be fine if you if you. And I always had that thought in the back of my mind, like, bro, if you get through this shit, you're gonna be fine. And that's where I'm at now. Like, I'm I'm cool with whatever I'm going through. And that year, man, 2018, man, that's why I tell people, bro, like, if anybody have any issues with anxiety or, or you know any pressures they got, or panic attacks and shit like that, man, I, talk to me, bro. Like, I, that's that's the main thing that was, a lot of us don't have, you know what I'm saying? Not everybody got money for therapy and shit. Sometimes you just need to tell somebody to know that you're not alone. Sometimes knowing you're not alone is the key to solving all that shit. Is, is, the, panic, uh, is the panic attack thing where you think you got a heart attack or something? It's, yeah, it's mental and it's physical, bro. Cause like my anxiety, some people have certain anxieties like I'm, I'm afraid of bottles and shit and they see it and they get scared. Some people just have like, Future, they're scared of future shit that they th they thinking about, and it's just like a, it's like a feeling right here, and it's just like a like an elevator door opening, like it's just on you, and you're trying to find uh, something to like. You got to focus on different things, like uh, I, you know, sometimes you got to count back from ten or uh, focus on the color in the room or listen to something. Everybody has their own way of dealing with it. Um, and some people you don't even know, like like comedians, like like uh, B Simone. One time she uh, had, she was about to do a show, and she started flipping the fuck out, like not like zapping out, but she started just like panicking, walking around, wouldn't take a shit. And I'm sitting there thinking like, you B Simone, man, you funny as shit, you know, and the other person was like, nah, she just be sometimes she be wild like that sometimes. And everybody has their own, but my shit was more so like my anxiety was more so like a person that was just like, there's nothing going on right now, everything's going well. Watch this, and then <laughs> and I would just fucking panic, and I started to have to like uh, my brother. I always had good conversations with him. My brother's a night owl, but he never really said why. He's like, why do you think I'd be up all night all the fucking time, keeping my mind busy? Because sometimes your mind is such a spinning wheel of ideas and 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 what's happening next in the future, or what's I fucked up on this in the past. How do I clean this up? You know, you start to like worry too much. And he was like, bro, you just gotta figure out in the moments of you having a panic attack, attack the idea of the panic attack. Pinpoint everything that's going on in your life right now that's strenuous, really good, really bad. Cause sometimes it'd be good energy that make you have a fucking panic attack. It's so much good shit going on. Can I handle this shit? You know what I'm saying? And your body don't be knowing the difference. You know what I'm saying? Your body be like, nigga, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> Get me out of here. And once I started focusing on what I had ahead of me, it's like, nigga, you trying to do sketches, you trying to be a father, you trying to get these fucking flights together, you writing for Jess, you want your jokes to be perfect for her, you know, you, you, you trying to make sure your relationship is good, all the, all the old things in your life are now changing into new things, you're getting rid of old friends. But, hey, I'm glad you brought this up, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of dudes, in regards to black men, right? Yeah. When you grew up in the hood, whatever you want to say, you're so used to things going wrong. Yeah. So when things go right, it freak you out, bro. It freaks you the fuck out, bro. You be literally like, no, it's too much shit going on. It's this good. 
I might have get robbed or something like <laughs> automatically no, you feel like that. You know what I'm saying? Like even when going on tour with her, like nobody it's 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 a rare thing to be able to even go on tour, bro. Like it's a dream. You really do it because you hopefully you think it's gonna happen, but my ass, I was so stubborn, I mean, this shit gonna happen to me. I know I'm doing this shit. I wanna go on tour, take care of my family, this is what I wanna do. But some people they're doing it so much, you you live in the dream, you live in it's gonna happen, I'm gonna grind. Eventually your ass got to become that star soon. Your ass gonna be that star and you gotta be ready for it. So, you know, when things are going good, take the shit. You know what I'm saying? Believe in yourself enough to know that you deserve this shit. I know I deserve every fucking thing I get. That's the so, that's the key in the sense that like yeah. in our culture it's a high level of self sabotage. Yeah, man. And like you have to as you said, you have to really feel first of all, you gotta love yourself, but you gotta feel deserving. That's I think mm-hmm. that's the core. People yeah. don't think they're deserving a certain level of goes, success. It goes back so many years, man. Even looking at good times. You look at shows like good times. Eight times some good shit was about to happen, and some fucked up shit right around the corner. You know what I'm saying? And we feel like we have to like struggle all the time for some good shit to happen. No, man. Sometimes God is just like, no, nah, these are blessings, bro. Just take the blessings. Ain't nothing around the corner. <laughs> and we feel like that a lot, man. So as I grew in my career, man, I knew as long as I stay on this path, as long as I stay consistent and be true to this shit, got to be true to your gift. Can't do this shit for no clout. Can't do this shit for just views and likes. You got to be true and love this shit, man, and love yourself. And once the God start giving you them gifts, don't be questioning God, man. Just be saying, thanks, God. Let me bless somebody else. Let me continue to bless others because it's going to come back to me no matter what. Shit, you don't got to struggle to always get the good shit, man. You know what I'm saying? So... Yeah. How was it in B more when you in the streets now? Like it's crazy love people. I'm taking yeah, everybody man. recognize you now, right? Yeah. And then, then being in Baltimore, nigga, when niggas stare at you too long, you be like, this nigga trying to bring a move. <laughs> but sometimes men don't know how to embrace men. Men be like, they be like, you the, you the funny nigga and shit, man. Yeah, yeah. Cause even the other day I took I took Zoe up Mondarmin to go to get something to eat. <laughs> Mount Dom- <laughs> Mondarmin. Yeah, he went to Mondarmin. That shit scared you, didn't it? <laughs> But took her to Mondon. So I take my kids around hood shit just to see, like, this is what your ass could be. I took him in the Burger King Mondon and this dude walked to me and dapped me up, like, on some, like, oh, Daddy, what's up, man? What's going on, bro? And you know, you can't, you don't just be dapping nobody with no goddamn Mondon. You don't know where their hands been. You get fucking chlamydia and shit. He dapped me up, like, what's up, man? Daddy, you funny nigga, man. And I'm looking at him, like, this thing about to say some wild shit. I'm got my kid here, but I had to fight this nigga in front of everybody in Burger King, in front of my child. He said, nah, man, I just wanna give you your flowers. I, while, you, I, while I'm standing in front of you, man, I just want to give you your flowers, bro. Like, you do a lot. And I appreciate you. Funny as shit, man. Please keep going, bro, because you don't know how many motherfuckers is watching you. I'm like, the fuck you mean my niggas watching me? He was like, nah, and I'm just mean, like, I'm like, nah, I got to fucking fight this. <laughs> I got to wipe my niggas watching me. But he was like, nah, he just kept saying, I just want to give you your flowers now. This is a little young hood nigga, man. He was like, I just want to give you your flowers. I was like, all right, man, pull the ski mask down so I can see him hugging the face and shit. But yeah, man, we got we got to also embrace each other too as men, man. So I appreciate that, brother. And that's real because it take a lot of love. I just noticed that it's well, it's not always real. Maybe, maybe some phoniness in there, but it take a lot for a man to give another man credit. Take in a lot, bro. Whole lot, man. Because <laughs> most we, people won't say nothing. bro. Don't say nothing. <laughs> you can save a nigga from drowning. He be like, nah, I ain't no bitch. So I ain't gonna give you a prop because I ain't no little bitch. No, man, it's, it's okay to commemorate people, man, and highlight people because that one comment may have sent them on a whole other path just from hearing that because men are not just appreciated man you know what i'm saying my wife would call me beautiful sometimes and i don't even know how to take it she always like we've been together x amount of years and you still just can't take compliments i'm like i know i'm that nigga you know what i'm saying like i'm used to my mother my father always telling me i'm handsome you know what i'm saying but when she said it's always weird i'd be like yo go ahead with that shit man what you want what you want yo you want something shit but you gotta gotta take compliments fellas you know what i'm saying don't let it go to your fucking head but a lot of us, we so used to giving as men. We so used to be providing and just giving, you know. So man, learn to take your take your your blessings, fellas.